Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, you assholes asked for it, so I'm going to give it to you. It's a Q&A with me, and it's uh, really across the board. It's whatever you want to talk about. Um, I'm purposefully leaving out most of the dog questions that I got so that uh, I can dedicate those to specific team dog um, Q&As. Uh, there's a couple in here I'm going to answer. A bunch of these questions are, are kind of repeats where I got you know four or five, six of the same questions. So um, if I don't answer your specific question, uh, it's because it was already asked. Uh, I'm going to get right into it, and uh, I, I just want to say thank you. I'm, I'm flattered that uh, there's enough of you that, that give enough of a shit to hear what I have to say to, to listen in the numbers that are listening. Uh, I'm flattered. Frankly, I wouldn't fucking listen to me, but uh, I'm glad that you guys want to. So uh, here we go. Selkie Lab uh, asks, Mike, I have a question for you. How do you fill the void when your dog slash best friend suddenly passes away? I don't know what to do without my baby. Rip Selkie baby. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Here's the deal. Uh, loss fucking sucks, plain and simple. Um, whether it's people, whether it's dogs. With dogs, they're, they're, for whatever reason, seems to be an even harder time with them. I don't know if it's because they live shorter lives or they're better than most fucking people, um, that they're loyal beyond measure. And, and in terms of the man's best friend adage, we get the, the better end of the deal 10 times over. Uh, what I try to do, and again, whether it's uh, dogs or people, um, is I try to, to focus on and remember the good, the good shit, the good times that I had with them, um, you know, and, and appreciate the time that I had with them. You know, not, not everybody gets to have that dog that, uh, the, that is everything to them. Uh, I, I consider it a, both a luxury and a pleasure to be able to own a dog. I mean, to live in a country where we have enough resources and, and, uh, and people are wealthy enough to be able to, to care for an animal in their fucking house. Uh, I think you should appreciate that. So think of it more from the big picture, I, I think is a good way to deflect and not sit around, you know, kind of sulking and feeling sorry for yourself about losing it. it. It's fucking tough. I mean, one of the tough things about running the warrior dog foundation is, is having to make those end of life decisions for a lot of these warriors. And, and it does not get any easier. Every one of them rips my fucking heart out of my chest uh, and is is a couple of days of, of feeling pretty shitty about it. Uh, but then I think about all the po positive impacts that they've had. You know, and, and again, whether it's saving comrades in arms lives or, or being, you know, a hell of a good loyal companion to you. Remember those good times and, and don't sit around and and think about what you just lost, at least as best you can. That's uh, that's how I like to do it. All right. N underscore bounds asks scariest moment while getting hazed so it's actually the absence of getting hazed um the first hazing story i was brand new in a platoon at seal team three uh and i was the intel rep so i was actually at a at a school when my entire platoon went out of town on a trip and um I was showing up basically just one day late to finish the school. They left on a, on a Friday and I, I was showing up on Saturday. So I, I show up the next morning, uh, 15 hours behind the platoon. And, uh, I get this, you know, plotting on me with ass eyes. I'm getting eye fucked by all the, the other new guys. There was a bunch of us and, uh, you know, I'm looking around and there's black eyes and fat lips and hate and discontent. And I was like, what the fuck happened? And, uh, Turns out, you know, that was the the initiation hazing was that night, and I missed it. I was the only new guy there that didn't get the new guy initiation hazing. And so naturally, I'm getting the your next motherfucker uh, from all the, all the seasoned guys. Uh, and we were out there for, I believe it was about 10 days. And um, so here's the beauty of it is that they never hazed me while I was out there. They did later, but uh, that was the worst fucking part of it was not getting hazed showing up and, and all the other new guys that uh, that had gotten hazed and I didn't. Uh, one, I felt like a total douchebag because I didn't, you know, <laughs> I didn't get mine. Uh, not that I was looking forward to it, but I just, you know, I felt like an asshole for not uh, not being one of the guys. And so, you know, I, I was sleeping in different rooms and, you know, under under trucks. And I mean, I, I I mean, I had a head on a swivel the whole time. And, uh, and I think that was the whole point is that they uh, <laughs> they made sure that I was just you know, 
shitting myself waiting for this to this other foot to drop and it never did the whole time we were out there so that was actually worse than any hazing i ever got um all right brian horsey two-part do you have any regrets over the years and what do you feel is your greatest accomplishment in life so far I do not have any regrets, really. Um, you know, it's really easy to look back on any decision, whether it's a big life decision, a micro decision, whatever, and second guess at armchair quarterback. And I think it's, I think it's crucial to not fucking do that. Uh, I, I don't do that on purpose. It's not that I don't have plenty of decisions in my life, and frankly, fucking even today, uh, that I could have done better. But uh, I don't think that that's positive. Uh, yes, you can learn from your mistakes, but to have regrets, I mean, the fact is, is that, you know, you're at where you're at. Um, and even if you've made a ton of bad decisions, don't regret it, learn from it. You know, don't view it as something that, that is a negative that you're regretting. View it rather than as a positive in that something that maybe you learned it the hard way, but it's something that uh, that you took something from and, and now you know better. Uh, to me, that's that's how you should live your life, uh, hands down. My greatest accomplishment in life so far. Um, I don't really view that the same way either than I think most people where I have this kind of pinnacle of, of you know, my accomplishments. Um, but, um, you know, off the top of my head, and just so you guys know, these questions, like I've sifted through them very casually just to, to know which ones I'm going to answer and, and not, but I, I've not put really any thought into it. The, the thing that comes to mind uh, in asking me that is when I was a canine trainer, um, you know, for for the SEAL teams, um, you know, this was back, you know, almost uh, eight years ago now. But, um, you know, for, for me, that was kind of a, a pinnacle of being able to take my experience in the soft community and, and my knowledge as a dog guy and combine them to now be working with, uh, handlers that, you know, some of them I'd been to war with some, uh, I was instructors with, uh, and to have that kind of responsibility on my shoulders of being, you know, helping find dogs and helping train dogs, uh, you know, and, and trying to, to bridge that, that gap and pass that knowledge on, uh, that these guys are going to be dependent on these dogs with their life was pretty fucking special for me. Uh, and that's, that's just kind of what, what comes to mind. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that I'm, I'm proud of, of having done, but, uh, but that kind of sticks out uh, again, off the top of my head, uh, at taken in hand life asks, what's your advice to liberal guys for handing, handling their girlfriends slash wives, the way women really want in their man? Well, uh, Stop being a fucking liberal guy. Uh, that's going to fix about 99.10% of your fucking problems. Um, that's my take on it. I'm not going to fall into the trap of anything else that you're trying to, to maybe allude to, but uh, don't be a pussy. I mean, that's really the gist of it. Uh, I don't think women want that in a guy. They don't want a total dick, um, you know, but they want a guy who's going to get shit done and, and handle his fucking business and, and take action when it needs to be fucking taken. Um, and and be uh, be somebody that, that they can depend on. I mean, I you know I'm not a chick, but uh, that's my take on it. Is that you know if you're a, a spineless liberal fuck that uh, you know needs uh, needs to take your balls out of your wife's purse every time you want to you know buy a uh, put extra meat on a sandwich at Subway, then uh, then chances are you got much bigger fucking problems. All right. Uh, at OBS seven, seven, six, what is your most enjoyable, fun, valuable training course? You went on a, on a seal as a seal beyond buds. And what's the worst piece of shit waste of time course they sent you on. All right. Most valuable. Um, there was a couple of Intel schools that I can't really get into, uh, in terms of what they were, or what their names are, but, uh, there was a couple of them that, uh, that were awesome. I'd love to be able to share shit with you, but I can't worst piece of shit. Hands down hazmat. Um, you know, looking in the, the, I don't even a CFR or something or other code of federal regulations manuals. It has all this bullshit about how batteries need to be stored and, and all that kind of crap was fucking mind numbing. Uh, and I hated it. And, uh, I don't remember a time where I ever used it, uh, in terms of me thinking it was actually beneficial, but Mark Dalwinther asks, what is your favorite Hawkeye memory? Um, Ooh, probably uh, the wrestling dynasty that uh, that the Iowa Hawkeyes had in the 80s uh, under Gable. Um, you know, for me, I look fondly back during that time because I was growing up then and my dad was, 
uh, you know, had wrestled with Dan Gable in high school. And so, uh, you know, for me that, that was pretty fucking cool to, to witness that growing up in Iowa and getting to go to some of those meets and, and things like that. Uh, at tatted gentleman asks from your soft viewpoint, where do submarines and us submariners fall in line of sanity? And have you ever been on a submarine? I think you guys are fucking crazy. Um, submarines are awesome. Um, and, uh, to me, they're probably even more important from a tactical standpoint than aircraft carriers. Um, hats off to you guys for being able to fucking do what you do. I think it's, uh, it's, it's some incredible fucking technology and, and, uh, and a capability that, uh, that is really, really important. And, uh, the types of people, um, you know, similarly to special operations forces that are willing to go on submarines for, you know, weeks at a time and, and not even see sunlight. Uh, I think you got to be a, a special kind of twisted fuck to deal with that. Uh, just like a lot of the guys I used to work with for what we do, but, uh, hats off to you. I have been on a submarine, um, more from a touring standpoint, uh, or, or looking at certain things for certain reasons that I can't get into, but, um, I've, n I've never been on one undersea. Uh, I wish I had, um, but I haven't. At Austin J. Mesnard asked, during your career, what was the best foreign U.S. soft that you ever worked with and the worst? Really, any of the, any of the European guys, um, the Australian Norforce guys were, were pretty spot on. Yeah, I mean, really, you know, any Western civilized, you know, society has some pretty, pretty good fucking soft, soft forces. The can soft guys, Canadian fucking awesome dudes. I uh, love those guys. I uh, didn't do a lot of work with them. It was more just kind of, you know, running into them and, uh, in passing at different, uh, different bases we were at, but, uh, those guys are, are solid as shit. Um, yeah, I mean, really any, any Western society that's allied with us generally has some pretty, uh, pretty, pretty spot on soft guys. Worst, um, let's see, a couple of, couple of Middle Eastern, countries uh that were it was just fucking embarrassing frankly um yeah i mean yeah it was it was uh didn't give me a lot of hope in uh, some of the cross training we were doing i'll leave it at that at ch3 number two underscore chick 76 christ that name in and of itself is enough um what was the craziest engagement with the enemy that you encountered as an active seal um, not CE. That's my buddy Clint and the rubber gloves in the hotel room as rubber gloves could be considered the enemy. That, that was my best friend in that case. Who are you kidding? Uh, craziest engagement. Um, I actually talk about it in my, in the Trident canine warriors book. Um, after we took down the palace, Saddam's palace in his hometown of Tikrit, myself and, uh, and another guy were up on the rooftop and, uh, uh, almost took, uh, some mortar fire and got bailed out by, some counter artillery unit, uh, across the river. I didn't, we didn't even know was fucking there until, uh, mortar started just walking their way in. And, and I have no doubt if, if those guys weren't there and to this day, I have no fucking idea what unit it was or who they were with or any of that. But, uh, it sounded like a, a fucking transformer on the other side of the river after a couple of blips of light. And, and we saw these rounds getting walked in um, saved our ass. I, I would not be sitting here flapping my gums if it were not for those, those guys. So if you know who you were, reach out, love to have you on the show, but, uh, thank you. Cause you saved my fucking life. Daniel Gaspard, uh, comments. There have been those who have posed the idea of mandatory service to our country at age 18 with length to be one to two years minimum. Some stating that it doesn't have to be strictly military service, but could be done in a variety of forms, blah, blah, blah. Um, so Daniel, I, I agree. I think, um, mandatory service, I think two years would be good. Uh, and I would absolutely agree. It, it does not and should not be relegated to just the military. Uh, some people just aren't cut out for that shit. And I don't think you should shove a square peg in a round hole for people that just would, wouldn't be an asset. They would be a liability. I don't care how good it is for them. You know, the military, I think it's, uh, used as a social experiment in some regards, especially with the last fucking administration. But, uh, that's another episode. Um, but you know, to clean people's act up or things like that, that's not what the military's for. Uh, I see that a lot of, well, it's send criminal, you know, like if you're a, a, a world-class douchebag, like, no, I, the, you don't send, send them to the military to fuck things up and to straighten them out. It's not a boarding school. Um, on the same token, um, you know, I, I think that 
by doing a mandatory service for everybody and including the military is that that's one of the options for the people that choose that is that it does one main component, which is teaches you to uh, the main component, which breaks down into two points, really, which is teaching yourself uh, that it's not fucking about you, you know, for for as entitled as our country. And I, I pick on millennials a lot. But let's be honest, like our entire country is 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 gotten more and more feeling of entitlement uh, in the last couple of decades. Some of it's because of sec- success in technology. Um, you know, there's a host of other reasons. But, um, you know, I think everybody could use a little bit of humble pie getting shoved down their throat of saying, you know, hey, there, there's a bigger picture here. Uh, and the second point is 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 serving others. Uh, you know, they, they dovetail onto one another. But uh, I think that that, that would be a an incredibly valuable lesson uh, for kids between high school and the rest of their lives to um, to really learn about what that is, what, you know, that it, A, it's not about them and what it's like to serve other people. And it could be I- anything. I mean, it could be American Red Cross. It could be, you know, civil service on on a host of different capacities. You know, there's there's a lot of different things out there. I mean, it could be Boys and Girls Club. It could be soup kitchens. I mean, just something where two years of your life has to be dedicated to doing something where you're helping other people um, and serving our country in some capacity, I think, would be uh, would be fantastic. James Hornsey uh, says, I came to a conclusion after taking a recent combat pistol course. A lot of us civilians conceal a firearm on a daily basis. However, most of us, including me, would be incapable of unfucking ourselves long enough to actually use our firearms in a self-defense situation. I'm curious, do you stay? How do you? Uh, what you do to stay proficient with your firearms? Do you use drills, dry fire, or shoot a lot? Um, D all of the above. Um, you know, my advice to to civilians out there. Uh, I get asked a lot. You know, conceal or open carry. Fucking conceal all day long. I don't think it should be illegal. I think open carry should be legal because again, it's a free country. You're not going to catch me doing that shit. Um, I don't want people to know I, I have a gun if I was carrying one. Um, you know, that that's just the reality of it is. And, and it should stay tucked away unless you absolutely fucking need it. Uh, in terms of people gaining that experience, just like with everything else, practice. You know, and that's all forms of practice. You know, yeah, go to take combat pistol courses. To, you know, go to the range and, and self-practice uh, dry fire. Make sure you're not an idiot shooting holes in your fucking drywall. Make sure that it's unloaded. Um You know, if you're practicing at home and don't point, you know, basic shit, don't point it at anything or anywhere that you're not willing to to put a bullet through. So, uh, but, you know, yes, you should, you should practice as much as often uh, and in many different forms as possible so that you're not that guy that's incapable of unfucking yourself uh, when the shit hits the fan. Because the reality of it is, is that, uh, you know, you may be put in that position uh, whether you like it or not. So uh, if if you're going to take on the responsibility of carrying a firearm, be good with it, be competent, know how to use it, and do us all a favor in doing so. Jared Yeager, love the podcast, Mike. As a SEAL, did you have access to physical therapists, athletic trainers in the sense of preventative medicine, trying to stay ahead of the aches and pains, keeping you in prime fighting shape? Jared, I would say that uh, we did, not to the degree in which uh, I, I think would have been appropriate, you know, the reality of it is the job is really hard, uh, on, on our bodies. And, uh, I know that they've gained leaps and bounds from when I was in. Cause I mean, at, at, at this point I've been out, it'll be 10 years in November. So it's been a while. Uh, but there needs to be more of that. They need to take better care of, of, uh, of their, um, operators than, uh, than they do, or at least did. Uh, so there, there was some, but it was woefully inadequate. Um, which is why my body hurts like a motherfucker most days. But Michael Thompson, context is OCR, but if you're planning to spend time racing through mountainous terrain but training in an urban environment, would you choose Jacob's Ladder versus Step Mill versus Running versus... Here's what I would do is is a combination of a couple of things. Um, the, the C2 rower is a motherfucker. Uh, I would say that and an Airdyne bike, those two things combined, um, is going to give you probably the most bang for your buck. I wouldn't probably mess with treadmills. I damn sure would, I would stay the fuck off of an elliptical, um, you know, but, uh, Jacob's ladder is, is good. Uh, also to me, bang for the buck again, I would, I would, 
I would buy two pieces of gear, and that would be the C2 rower, which I have, and, and an Airdyne. So, yeah, those two things are going to kick your ass and uh, and give you everything you need. Uh, Andrew Bloomberg says, I was listening to another podcast, Army Rangers telling funny shit stories. Do you have any funny shit stories, yours or ones you've witnessed or heard about? Um, yeah, as a matter of fact. When we were in Iraq, we were in a long ass convoy with the first Marine division in the middle of fucking Baghdad. And it was midday, hot, sunny, bright. And, uh, I could not wait any longer. And we were just sitting there. So I, I popped out of the vehicle, uh, slung fucking M4 in hand and, uh, went and right in front of the vehicle I was riding in and, and just behind the other one, it was about four feet of space. And I squatted down right there and shat right in the middle of the fucking street, um, and that uh, that was it. So yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, another shit story. There's another question that uh, that I think asks uh, something about the name of this podcast, which you'll you'll know how that relates here in a minute. Uh, Kent Mahar McHarg asks, "What's your favorite metal band? Who's your favorite guitar player? Guitar influences? Do you have dudes that you jam with? Uh, favorite metal band is it's tough to pick a favorite." Uh, Avenge Sevenfold and Metallica are, uh, and, and Pantera are kind of the three musketeers of metaldom, uh, in my opinion. Um, I went to a couple Pantera shows thanks to my boy, Seth. Uh, I've gone to some Metallica shows here recently that have been world-class experiences. Um, and then Avenge Sevenfold, same thing. I've been to a number of their shows. Um, all the guitarists for all three of them, Dime, Dimebag Daryl, Sinister Gates and Kirk Hammett, uh, those three guys. Uh, I would also say Zach Wild. He is an absolute fucking pipe hitter on on the guitar. I saw uh, Ozzy and and he played for him at Sturgis last year, and it was uh, it was fucking epic. It was awesome. Do I have dudes I jam with? Not really. Uh, Frogman twenty one fifty five came up and we uh, and we hit it. Uh, I'm looking to. It looks like the Reaper just started playing Nick Irving. Uh, or, or at least plays, which I didn't know. I saw some Instagram posts with him on there, so maybe we'll get him up here and do a, a Ranger and Two Seals jamming with Frogman, and that'd be pretty awesome. But, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's the gist. Uh, Brian Beam, if you could hang out with three people, dead or alive, for a full day, who would it be and what would you do? i I got to tell you, I love this this question. Um, let's see. I would uh, I would hang out with Jesus. And, uh, I would, I would have, I would want to know what the fuck, honestly, like I would have a lot of questions for that guy. Um, and I would want to see what, uh, what he was really like, you know, obviously there's a lot of people that know about him, um, and none of them have ever met him, uh, or have ever met anybody that's met him. So, uh, you know, to me with the amount of popularity that he has and uh, and with, you know, the story behind that, I, w- I would like to pick Jesus's brain and um, and see see what he's all about. Um, second person would be uh, Leonidas from uh, from the gates of Thermopylae or from the Battle of Thermopylae, Thermopylae rather. And uh, I'll tell you what I'd like to do is two things. I would spend the day, I would spend the first day uh, and I would want to fight him. Not with weapons, not with, you know, he's obviously way more fucking skilled in a broadsword and a a shield than I would be. He's not going to stand a chance against a pistol against me. So I would say, you know, in a pair of fucking shorts and, uh, you know, in a sand pit or or a wrestling mat, and and I would want to fight him, not to fucking kill each other. But here's why is that, you know, that was a couple thousand years ago. And I think it would be really cool to see, you know, a, a warrior of that magnitude with that reputation that's lasted this long. And just to see, you know, what, what that motherfucker is like, honestly, like how strong is he? Is he going to treat me like a, like a schoolgirl, uh, or am I going to hold my own with him? Uh, I would love to know that question. I'd love to see like, is, is it like trying to grab a fucking grizzly bear and throw him around? Is he going to beat me to death? Like what, what would that be like? Because there's, it's been such a long time that I think that'd be a hell of a neat, uh, experiment to just see, uh, what those warriors back then, uh, were like, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if I got my fucking ass handed to me. But, you know, what better guy to have your ass handed to you by than that guy? So, but at any rate, I'd, uh, I damn sure would, uh, would make him earn it. And, uh, and either way, you know, who knows, maybe it would go the other way. I don't know. But, uh, I, to me, that'd be a pretty neat experience to fight that son of a bitch. And then the second half of the day would be spent, uh, strategizing, talking to him about military strategy, um, and getting some kind of, uh, 
you know, thoughts, uh, you know, both philosophical and strategic from uh, warrior mentality and, and uh, how he lives his life and the things that are important to him, um, you know, how he sees society and, and, uh, and the Republic with which he uh, defends and, and things of that nature. I think it'd be pretty, pretty awesome to get his perspective on, uh, on some of those things. Last, um, I would, uh, I would hang out with mother Teresa. Uh, and here's why, uh, if there's one thing that I know that I absolutely suck at, it's, it's being empathetic. I, I have very little empathy for a lot of people. And, and that is one of my weakest or biggest character flaws. Um, I, I know that, uh, it's something that I, I am conscious of, um, but I, I am a kind of a bitter, angry fuck. And, um, and I think it would do, do me probably a great service to hang out with somebody like that and, uh, and stick my ego in my back pocket, uh, hanging out with her. And, and, uh, just like I was saying earlier about serving other people is that, um, you know, getting a little bit of balance in my life in terms of, uh, shutting the fuck up and helping people out. I think it, it would be good for me to hang out with her and, and spend the day doing exactly what she was, uh, so well known for. Uh, Damien Costanza, did you ever work with any Australians during your service? Do you have any good stories? Uh, yeah, we worked with some Norforce guys up in Darwin, uh, up in the, the uh, Northern Territory. And, uh, you know, I was expecting Mick Dundee. Lo and behold, he didn't show up. Uh, but the, uh, there were some good fuckers, you know. Um, in terms of, of good stories, uh, it was just neat to work with. It, it was my first time working with, uh, with foreign military forces um because it was the first part of my first deployment so um it it was just neat to see you know their their weaponry and and their gear and stuff being so different and uh and getting to work with them was was pretty neat uh ryan flanagan asks since cbd oil treats are becoming more popular can you discuss the benefits through all life stages uh dog puppy senior i'll just answer this real quick is that i I would just recommend anybody that has questions go to trichosupplements.com uh, and there's a lot of FAQs on there. Uh, the gist of it is mostly anxiety, inflammation, digestion, uh, mobility, things like that. But there's a host of other benefits, uh, even helping with uh, with cancer in a lot of cases. So uh, go on that website, check it out, um, and uh, and you can you can learn more there. I don't know who asked this, but uh, it says also. I'm assuming this is from Ryan. Also, is the Earth round or flat? It boggles my fucking mind that there are people out there that uh, think that the world is flat. You know, I know some of them are joking, unfortunately. I know some of them are not. To me, if you can see pictures from outer space with a round fucking planet, uh, that kind of tells you, you know, what fucking shape it is. I don't know why that's uh, rocket science. Why is that rocket science at this point? I don't I don't know, but it is. Uh, Charles... Oh, Edder, Otter, uh, did you ever have any aspirations to join DevGrew? And if so, what kept you from achieving so? Uh, yes, I did. After I got back from Iraq, I wanted to uh, go there, and it didn't pan out for me. Uh, I got valley fever back in 2004 and lost a significant part of my lung capacity permanently. And uh, from that point on, um, physically, I, I, I don't believe that I was... Um, at the capacity uh, cardiovascularly to be able to to operate even in the regular SEAL teams, let alone uh, at Dev Group, um, and so I I spent the last couple of years as an instructor getting as healed up as I could, and then uh, had to pull chalks on the Navy. Otherwise, I I would have stayed in, uh, but that uh, that's what happened. So uh, John Whistle uh, says, "What kiss K I S S keep it simple, stupid situation do you apply to your everyday life?" I got to tell you, almost fucking everything, um, you know, that that piece of advice has saved a lot of headaches for me and a lot of people. Um, you know, a lot of times people say, well, you're oversimplifying things. You know what? Sometimes life needs to be fucking oversimplified because we as human beings, being the emotional fucking basket cases that we are, need to oversimplify things because we overcomplicate the shit out of it. So stop worrying about things you can't control um, and just simplify it. You know, if you can control it, do your best with what you have. If you can't stop fucking worrying about it, it's really that simple. That's not oversimplifying it. It it is that simple because that's the only thing you can do uh, and have any control over. So stop fucking worrying about it and, uh, and keep it simple. 
B Dub Wardy Mike, uh, Brian from New Zealand. Who is the scariest motherfucker you've ever met in the teams? The person that would out Jocko Jocko. I've met a lot of fucking guys in the in the SEAL teams that uh, you know I would I would lump into the category of just a, a scary motherfucker. I mean, most of them are honestly. I mean, they all are to a certain extent, and that uh, you know to get through that training, uh, it is it is a feat. Um, it's a it's a hell of an accomplishment. I mean, there's there's been a lot of guys that uh, you know were just textbook consummate fucking warriors that uh, you know that that I have the utmost respect for and, and feel honored to been in, been in the position to just be able to serve with with those guys. Uh, I can't can't really pick anyone. I would just say the the community as a whole. Timothy Queering, Mike, what is your favorite tattoo, and where were you when you got it? sipping any particular whiskey at the moment jesus it's the middle of the day tim no uh no i'm not uh, i actually i actually don't drink very much hardly at all honestly but uh and i'll get into that here in a in a few more questions but in terms of my favorite tattoo i, I don't have a favorite there's the the three big main tattoos that i have all hold a special place and there's been a number of questions about this so i'm just going to address it with yours uh where i was what they mean uh, all that kind of stuff um Somebody else asked uh, where my first one was, so I'll address that quick. Uh, I have little seals and frogs in a band around my right ankle. Uh, yes, I am embarrassed to admit that. That was my first tattoo, um, and I got it on the desk of an accounting firm. Uh, total, like, not black market, but outside what's uh, above board. And uh, I, it was, you know, after hours, it was a friend of a friend that did tattoos, and I said, "Hey, this this looks lame. Why don't you put this on the body on my body for the rest of my fucking life?" Uh, it's it's a lame ass tattoo, but it was the first one I got, and I uh, got it on the desk of of some asshole's office uh, at, at nine at night. Um, the other I've got four other ones, three that are are special to me. Uh, the next one that I got is the bone frog covering my rib cage. Uh, that is a textbook calling card uh, seal tattoo that uh, means a lot to me because when I was a student, uh, the guy that drew that, uh, Keith Kamura, died. Uh, at, he was an instructor. He died in the, in the dive tower from a shallow water blackout. And uh, he had, had drawn that. And so a bunch of the instructors, uh, when my generation was going through, got that tattoo you know, at, at that time. And, and it inspired a lot of us and kind of just took off like wildfire. And, and a lot of guys got it. The other two tattoos um, I've got, it's basically a, a, the Navy Gadsden flag rendition. It's a, it's just a, a rattlesnake wrapped around an anchor on my left arm. And then the, the head of, of the snake goes down my chest with you know, fierce eyes and his tongue sticking out, almost licking my nipple, which is pretty hot, let's be honest. Why that one is important to me is because of the guy that did it. Uh, shout out to Warpaint 513. That motherfucker is the real deal, uh, and he has put more ink on more fucking badasses than anybody on the planet. Uh, to me, that one is exceptionally special uh, because because of who put it on there and, and the context with which it got administered, um, and it's great work. Um, the other one a guy goes by the handle Ant Ant Mike. Uh, he was on one of the one of the shows, uh, one of the the tattoo contests, and I think he won it actually. But it's kind of a, a rendition of the trident without being an actual trident. Like it's not, you know, the, the traditional actual picture of a trident, but it's all of the pieces, the flintlock, the trident staff, the anchor, and the eagle. Uh, the eagle, same kind of thing. It's on, the, on my right side. Uh, the anchor's on, on my arm. Uh, the trident staff goes down my forearm, which you can see in a lot of pictures. And then the, the eagle wings are across my chest uh, going all the way up, up, up onto my neck. Uh, and my my shoulder um and uh to me that's uh important and special for obvious reasons that that trident is is the the insignia with which uh, us seals identify ourselves and so that uh, that's pretty good uh, and it was very well done the guy is is a huge talent uh, i went to tucson to get it at uh, at a tattoo shop there but shout out to him for doing a, a fa fantastic job all right um uh, luke edmonds during your time in the teams who made the biggest positive impact on you and why you know again this kind of falls in line with who's the scariest mofo is that um the community did um without a doubt you know my first leading petty officer lpo uh, i'll just say tb probably doesn't want his name on here uh, and then my platoon chief um 
DG, that was his initials, is that both those guys, you know, really played a huge role, but so did all the other guys in the platoon, all the guys at the team. I mean, every guy that I've I've come in contact with in the community, I mean, I, I can't express, I can't even begin to express the the benefit uh, and and the magnitude uh, that I didn't really understand at the time um, of the, of the caliber of men that I was fortunate enough to be surrounded by when I was in the SEAL teams. Um, you couldn't, you couldn't put a price on that. You, uh, I mean, that there isn't, is no amount of money that, that could be paid, uh, you know, that, that would uh, speak to how valuable that is. Um, and so it's really, it's the entire community. I mean, I've had a, there's tons of guys that at different stages in my career have, have played integral roles in, in developing, um, you know, me and, and getting me from where I was to, to where I, I went and, and all that. But, uh, it's just the community as a whole. It's, it's been, been incredible. Matt Bennett, what the thing you miss most about Iowa and what did you like the least? Um, Really, the 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 four the people and the four seasons, uh, the fall time specifically, uh, I I absolutely love and miss about Iowa. Uh, it's just such a good, honest place. Not a lot going on there in a good way. People care about their shit. They take good care of it. Very polite. Uh, it's just it's a great great state to to be raised in, and would be a great great state to raise kids in. I uh, I do miss just Iowa as a, as a whole. It's a it's a great place to grow up. What did I like the least? Um, the lack of terrain. Uh, I love the mountains, and and there aren't any there. Um, it gets cold as fuck in the winter, uh, and the lack of terrain. It just, uh, you know, yeah. And there's there's not a lot to do really. You know, which there's some huge good things about that, but um, but you know, to to pinpoint what I like the least, I'd say that that maxes it out. Robert Burke, favorite bourbon, uh, Blanton's uh, to drink, and Pappy's for special occasions. Pappy's uh, 15 year, actually, not the 20 or 23. But um, Mason Gerlock asks NFL protest, Nike making that douche the face, the fact that this exists. Uh, all right, I've had a lot of people ask me about Nike, the NFL, all this stuff. Here, here's my take is that I don't give a fuck, honestly. Um, you know, do I like seeing that? No, I don't. Uh, it's a free country, though. The NFL is a business. Nike is a business. They're, they're corporations just like mine is. Uh, I wish mine was a 64th the size of either one of them. But uh, here's the reality is that just like my business, I want to be able to run my business however the fuck I want to run my business. They are entitled to run their businesses however they see fit. Uh, if you don't like it, don't watch it. Uh, if you don't like Nike's ad campaigns, don't buy their shoes um, or their shirts or whatever the fuck. Uh, you know, to me... That's what this country needs to be about. You know, the First Amendment, uh, freedom of speech and, and just freedom and, and liberty across the board. It can't apply when it's shit that you agree with, because that's easy. You know, it, it has to be about when you don't agree with it, you know, when it's hard, when it pisses you off. That's when it needs to be able to be said, shown, demonstrated, etc., you know, yeah, I, I can remember coming back from Iraq and seeing anti-war protesters and it fucking pissed me off, you know, but but God damn it, that they need to be able to do that. You know, the, the, my only caveat to that is that it has to work both fucking ways. What I don't like about Twitter and uh, and the NFL in some regards is that they they cherry pick who they let say whatever the fuck they want. And that I have a huge fucking problem with now. Twitter uh, and the NFL, again, it's a business. So, yeah, they can do that. I, I don't like it, uh, but vote with your wallet or your eyeballs. You know, don't watch, don't buy, whatever, if you have a problem with that. Um, when it comes to social media, to me, that's a dicey subject because they're still businesses. If they want to censor people, you know, should they be able to? Yes. But uh, I do throw a caveat to that also in that as soon as if you're a social media platform, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, um, when you start censoring certain people and not others, to me, that's when you cross over into now you're, you're a fucking editor, you know? Uh, and so if you're going to edit people, then it needs to be, that needs to be a clause or a, an asterisk, uh, and, and you need to do it with everybody. Um, that's my take on it. Like it's a kind of an all or nothing thing. Like either you're responsible for the content and you're going to edit people and now you're a publication just like a fucking magazine is, 
or you don't and you let everybody run their mouth equally. To me, that does need to be hammered out. Um, whether or not that ever happens, who knows, but that's my take on it. Um, all right. N. Barkley 97. I've gotten a number of questions about SWIC, uh, Special Warfare Combatant Crewmen. Um, we'll call them the SEAL taxi drivers. No, I'm just fucking with you guys. You know that. You know I love you. Uh, can you talk about your interactions, impressions? Fucking great guys. Uh, will I have a SWIC on the podcast one day? Yes. If I can uh, work out the logistics of finding a good one to have on, uh, I'd, I'd love to have one on. They are an integral part of uh, the special warfare community. Um, no, they're not SEALs, uh, but they're tough guys, and and uh, and they do you know a, a damn good job at what uh, at what they do. And uh, I have a lot of respect for those guys, and and a handful of them that I actually still loosely keep in touch with uh, that I served with. So great, great dudes. It's B. I'm time. Uh, thanks for all you do during your time in combat. Uh, or training, did you ever feel like time slowed down in the moment? I, I actually, no, I didn't. Um, I never had those pauses where like it felt like I was in the fucking matrix and everything slowed way down. It was actually generally the opposite uh, in that it was like the blink of an eye and, and more shit happened than I could keep track of. Um, that's that's uh, been my experience with it is that uh, it was the opposite of that. But uh, so, yeah, I, n- I never had those those kind of feelings. Uh, or experiences rather uh steadfast 63 says when you do your world famous beef ribs and are, are they world famous i don't know i mean i guess if uh, people in in australia and fucking ireland are asking me uh about beef ribs maybe you could call them world famous but uh that's news to me uh, do you always use the same type of wood do you ever change it up um i so i would say generally speaking i like to use pecan uh, or a mix with either pecan with maybe a little cherry or a, just a little bit of hickory. Hickory and mesquite are two woods that you got to use like Tabasco. To me, if you're using that primarily, it it, it makes the, the meat bitter in my opinion. I, I prefer pecan for just about everything or mostly pecan. Again, I may throw in a little cherry, a little apple. I've even tried, you know, peach and, and pear and grape and uh, the grape looks like fucking stems. It, it's hard to hard to get much out of that, but... Um, I've used orange, um, strawberry, I'm fucking with you. There's no such thing as strawberry. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say I generally use pecan, um, as, as a base. And once in a while, if I'm feeling froggy, I'll throw some other shit in there. But, uh, what I wouldn't recommend is using, um, telephone poles or railroad ties, uh, cause that'll fucking kill you. But so stay away from that shit. Don't use two by fours either. What is your biggest regret? Uh, Mark uh, Flaherty, 65. What's your biggest regret? What are you most proud of? Again, I kind of already answered that, so I'm going to, I'm going to punt that one. Um, Conti underscore C underscore. What's the biggest motivator for you going through buds? How did you stop yourself from quitting when it is so easy to do so? Great question. Um, My biggest motivator, at least going through buds, um, was, it was honestly, it was proving something to myself and not wanting to let you know, my parents down. Uh, and I'll caveat that with my parents were not at all hard asses. I mean, my family growing up was like fucking leave it to beaver. It was almost sickening, honestly. Like they never fought super stable household. All four of us kids never really gotten any kind of trouble. We all got along really well. So it wasn't like there was this, I have this overbearing prick of a, of a dad that, you know, that, you know, is going to stick his foot in my ribs if I don't, you know, make it through. No, that was, it was the opposite. It was, it was just I wanted to make you know my family proud, and and I, I didn't join the Navy to quit. You know I, I joined to be a SEAL and was not going to to do anything else. Um, and so it, it I wouldn't say that it was easy, uh, but it was very simple uh, as to as to what that motivator was. Um, you know, one of the stories I, I share in in the Trident book also uh, is talking about when I got the shit beat out of me. Uh, in a race riot uh, in high school. And, and, you know, that had a huge impact on me too in terms of motivating me to to get out of that town. Not that it was a shithole, but just to go do something with myself and and uh, and use that to, to drive me to, to further myself. So uh, that, that was... That was the gist of it. It was it was weird uh, to be in a buds class where you see you know seventy five eighty percent of the students quit all around you guys that you that you're good friends with and and you were hoping to make it through with and, and they're standing right next to you and they say fuck this I'm out of here and then you're just like dude where are you going and, you know it just 
it is. It's really easy to quit, and the instructors try to make it even easier. But uh, yeah, that was for me. It was it was a pretty simple motivator. Uh, not not easy to to do it, but that's what I just always thought about. Johnny Roth underscore recalibrate uh, asks, "What book or books have you recently read? What book has had the biggest influence on you?" Let's see the book. So one thing, I mean, with all the guests that I have on any of them that have books or there's books where, you know, it's relevant to their story. I always read those um, prior to them coming on and make a, take a bunch of notes and, and prepare. So I'll kind of leave those out cause that's kind of work related. Um, the let's see meditations um, book um, is, is probably the one, well, it's a combination. It's a combination of uh, meditations by Marcus Aurelius and uh, and also um, self reliance, which is a kind of a combination. As is the meditations book, but um, by Thoreau. That it, to me, those two books. You know, while one is is essentially transcribed from two thousand years ago, and the other one is you know about, about two hundred, almost two hundred years ago. What's amazing to me is that they're they're both equally timeless, uh, equally impactful, and and incredibly fucking relevant to today. And to me, that's one of the reasons why I would hang out with who I would hang out with um, is is because I think wisdom is relatively timeless. Um, I think most most human beings towards the end of their life have very very similar reflections on on their lives um, and how they should be lived. Um, you know, hats off to the people that figure it out a little earlier and can implement it before they're 90, you know, but to me, like it's, it's such a waste to not learn from people who have already done it. Like for the love of Christ, get out there and talk to old people. Um, you know, but you know, in terms of the, of the books, those two books are, I'm, I'm, you know, co-reading both of them right now. Cause I, I just, it's, I find it fascinating. Um, very, very impactful too, but all right, next question. Lincoln 2016 underscore GSD. What's the hardest thing you had to overcome, deal with, uh, with your time within the teams? Example, family issues, internal t- internal team issues, command, et cetera. For me, it was it was um, kind of a, a loss of, um, of mo- not motivation, but a loss of, uh, of believing in the entire government structure. Um, you know, for me that as I got older and, and had been in the military longer and, and you kind of start to see behind the curtain a little bit, you know, when you're 19 to 25 or, or even, you know, later, but especially in those early 20s years, late teens, early 20s, it's really easy to be naive and just wave the flag and, you know, um, God, country, mission first, all, all that kind of stuff. And, and while I'm not scoffing at that, uh, please don't take it uh, as such, but um when you start to see guys where you start to see politics are, are involved and decisions are made based on career goals versus what's fucking right, that leaves a bitter fucking taste in your mouth when, when you're putting your life on the line and going overseas. And then it compounds by a government who, same thing, I think most congressmen and senators are, uh, are in it for the wrong goddamn reasons. You know, they spend most of their term trying to get reelected. There is an, an absolutely brilliant video clip by Ben Sass, a, a senator from Nebraska who I, I uh, have grown to like a lot in the last two weeks since I, I saw the video where it was during the confirmation hearings uh, for Justice Kavanaugh. And uh, everybody should take some time to, to listen to that. It's, it's brilliant, exceptionally well executed and, and, uh, and verbalized. And I think really kind of sums up what I'm talking about far better than I can do it. Um, but, you know, to me, the gist of it is that the government needs to, to, to work for the people and not the other fucking way around. And, and I, I found myself being irritated by the people who are making the decisions for where our military goes, who they do it with, how they execute it, um, you know, the, the budget with which they can execute it and, and what they're allowed to buy or not. Uh, and then seeing the things that they're doing and, and the, you know, the different uh, spending bills that, that they're putting on the table and pieces of legislation that they're drafting and things of that nature that I think, uh, you know, started to make me pretty, pretty bitter. So for me, that that was the, honestly the hardest thing. It, it wasn't family issues. It wasn't any issues with the guys. It was more on a leadership. Uh, and the further up the chain, the worse it got. 
uh, you know, that because that's ultimately those are the shot callers. I mean, th those are the people who are, are making the decisions that are really, really impacting your life. It's generally not the guy next to you. That's the fucking pipe hitter that you'll die for. Um, and so it, it uh, yeah, it went straight up the chain. That's that was my my biggest, biggest problem with it. Um, Hayden Deno Den Lower 19 uh, says, can you please explain what type of workouts you did? Uh, on your own in preparation for going to buds also your service and podcast greatly appreciated thanks um the type of workouts back when i was in it was the mid 90s when i was getting ready to go to buds um vhs tapes cj karachi um that those were the videos i watched uh and i also there was back then there was a it was called the buds warning order uh, which was this little stapled uh three or four pieces of paper that had some push-up pull-up uh, sit up, uh, swimming, running pyramid workouts, um, you know, run so many miles and build up to this and, you know, whatever. And, and, uh, it was pretty, pretty cheesy, but still very effective. I did those two things and ran and swam a lot and ate pretty clean, uh, and did, did that. There's so many resources out there now of people with videos and, and online subscription programs and all manner of shit that, uh, you know, that can set you up for success way better than, than what I had. So, uh, you know, if that's what you're looking for, I would, I would look, uh, look at those, those folks. All right. Let's see. Chandler 1129, most embarrassing drunk story and most embarrassing deployment story. Uh, most embarrassing drunk story. I had just turned 21 and, uh, there was a young lady that I uh, was kind of dating. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I, you know, it was a group, she was going to a local university, um, and there was a, a handful of us and I ended up long story short as I, I had way too much to drink and I ended up on my knees, uh, face down, basically in a fucking downward dog, uh, in her front yard. And it wasn't her, it wasn't a place like it was a fucking apartment complex. Uh, I was in the downward dog until sun up from about two in the morning till sun up and, and filling, a little potted planter with, uh, with puke. Uh, and it was because of, uh, an entire bottle of Captain Morgan. And, uh, yeah, I felt like a, a complete numb nuts and looked like a complete numb nuts. And, uh, that was the most embarrassing drunk story I ever had. I, I didn't drink, uh, much after that, frankly, but most embarrassing deployment story. Um, hmm. I, there, honestly, there's not really anything that uh, that comes to mind that at least hasn't been talked about. Um, the thing that that does kind of pop up right away is is the story which I've already shared a number of times with Clint Emerson, Hunter Deadly Skills author, where his hand was buried up my ass trying to help me not be constipated. So, um, having to go to him and then have the entire pl platoon walk in and, and see that and find that out was uh, kind of a kind of a shit sandwich. Uh, which is going to lead me to the next question, which uh, falls kind of in line with that. This is the Mic Drop Podcast. What's the significance of drop? All right. Here is a free tidbit. Um, the significance of drop um, to me is kind of self-explanatory. I, I guess I would have hoped that it is in terms of when you drop the mic, is that that's kind of the style of uh, of talking that, that we do here is a uh, mic drop quality talking shit and saying things to each other and, and whatever, uh, using my name spelled M I K E as the substitute for M I C. However, what nobody knows, and I'm going to share this with you guys right now, uh, falling in line with some embarrassing shit. I actually came up with that name while I was taking a shit. Uh, and that is, that is the truth, uh, is that, well, I have no idea why, uh, but that's when it happened. Uh, I was taking a shit and, uh, and I thought mic drop just, it kind of hit, hit me like a lightning rod. I was just like, God, what a fucking brilliant name for a podcast. Cause that's how I talk is totally, you know, open, honest, uh, raw in your face, whatever. And my name is Mike. So that just seemed like a good fit, but I came up with it while dropping a fucking deuce, if you can believe it. All right. Uh, at Swift River GSD says, I'm interested to hear more about your political views. They seem really on point with what I feel is a general consensus. Um, here, here's the general consensus of my political views is actually very, very simple. And, and just like I was talking about earlier, I like to keep shit simple is, you know, to me, we are a republic, a constitutional republic. Um, and to me, because of that and, and the brilliance with which our forefathers drafted um, 
such an incredible document uh, as the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and and the amendments to go along with them. I, I think that that tells you what to do 99% of the time. I mean, to me, that should be the first question, is that when you have a question, a policy uh, argument, trying to determine what the fuck you want to do or not do, whether you want to involve yourself in foreign affairs or not, how to handle things at home with whether it's immigration, I don't give a shit what it is, is, you know, step one, question one, what does the Constitution say? You know, let that drive you because that's what it's there for. That's how our, our republic has been uh, designed around. Why the fuck do you not use that? One of the things that frankly drives me nuts is the term lawmaker. Why the fuck do we have lawmakers? I don't think we need any more goddamn laws. Uh, what does the Constitution say? Like that, that should be the document with which we let drive our country. Um, and why that's not taking place, uh, I wouldn't say is beyond me. I know why it happens is because there's a bunch of crooked fucks who are in charge of, of our government that uh, that take it upon themselves to continue to be crooked fucks. Uh, and, you know, to me, the fact that that uh, you pick any congressman or senator that you look at their net worth before they go to Washington, D.C., and you look at it afterwards, it's never, and I mean fucking never, in the in the red. It's never in the red by comparison. They're always worth way fucking more than when they joined that my friends, is a fucking problem. Uh, that should not be that way. Um, and that should be a cause for huge concern, in my opinion. The other thing is that I think it's 70 or 80 percent of the country's wealth is in the surrounding couple hours of Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. doesn't fucking produce anything. They don't manufacture anything. They don't farm anything. They don't generate anything except hate and fucking discontent amongst the American people. Why is there so much wealth there? There shouldn't be. How do you how do you regulate that? How do you ask some how do you ask a governing body to regulate itself and stop being crooked when it has the power to do so? I don't know how you do that, but that's my take on it. Very simply, is that let the let the uh, the constitutional republic uh, drive itself in a manner in which it's supposed to, which is uh, governed by the constitution, and uh, and that fixes most of the problems. I'm not a right-wing asshole. I'm not a bleeding uh, heart Democrat. I'm absolutely somewhere in the middle. There's a lot of things that I'm very conservative in terms of my viewpoints. There's plenty of things that I'm very, very liberal in my viewpoints. Uh, ultimately, I just want to be left the fuck alone, and I want every, everybody else to be left the fuck alone so that they can do whatever they want as long as it's not hurting people. And uh, hurting people does not include your fucking feelings. You know, here on Mic Drop, we don't give a shit about your feelings. I tell you that right out of the gate every episode. So, uh, that's my take on it. Uh, Ty Sudden Earth asks, how do you hit the reset button when you know that you fucked up and need to get back on track, not letting it mess with your mind in the future? It's a great question, Ty Sudden Earth. Um, here's, how you, here's how you do it. Uh, I alluded or I, I briefly covered it earlier, but um, when you know you fucked something up, step one is accountability. I mean, plain and simple, if there's one thing I can't stand, it's a motherfucker that can't admit when they're wrong or they've or they've messed up or they forgot to do something or they didn't do what they said they would or whatever it is, is that for the love of Christ, have some responsibility for your actions. That is step one. If you can't do that, then then nothing else is, is really going to make a shit bit of difference because you're you're already starting out by denying the fact that there was a problem. So number one is admit it, own it. And apologize for it. But there, there's a secondary point to that. Don't apologize by trying to half-ass chicken shit justify why you, you fucked it up. I, that's, that's equally or probably even more irritating when somebody says, yeah, you know what, I fucked that up. But, you know, in, in all reality, it's because you did this. No. When you fuck something up, I fucked it up. Roger that. I'm going to learn from it. It's my bad. Now, if if the asshole won't take your apology, then then say, you know, hey, what, what else do you want me to do? I apologize for it. Either fucking get over it or, or we're done. Uh, however, uh, you've got to own up first and foremost. Um, how do you move forward uh, and not let it mess with your mind? Very simply, is it, is it twofold? Is it number one, learn from that mistake, the intelligence behind the mistake. Don't let it just be a mistake. Make that mistake be a learning opportunity. Because that, that's the whole fucking point is that you fucked up, own it, learn from it, and don't do it again. How do you not let it mess with your mind? Very simple. 
just like I said earlier, is that if you can control it, do your best with what you have. If you can't, stop fucking worrying about it because it doesn't matter. You can't do anything about it. What what good does getting explosive diarrhea and having a panic attack about something that you don't have a shit bit of control over do you? Nothing. It does less than nothing. It's counterproductive because it actually detracts from what you're trying to do, which is control the things that you have control over to the best of your ability. All right, folks. Um, this is the end of the first question and answer session. Um, this is going to be a two part. I'm going to get into the rest of the questions now, but what I want you to take from, uh, from all of these, number one, the great questions. Uh, I enjoy answering them. I, I really do. Um, you know, again, it boggles my mind how many people give a shit what my opinion on some of these things are. But, uh, if you're asking for it, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, I think collectively we can all come up with good, good answers and solutions to our problems. And, uh, you know, if this helps any, uh, then, uh, then I'm happy to do it. So, um, if you got your panties in a twist, I'm glad, uh, if I've offended you fan fucking tastic, um, I am here to piss you off, um, to not give a shit about your feelings and to make sure that, uh, that we can round our country out and focus on the important shit, which is not, uh, how do we avoid hurting each other's feelings? So with that said, uh, as always, uh, it's been a pleasure and until next time, this is Mike.